or the Muslim philosophers, theologians, reflected upon what is the first step that is necessary on every seeker of the truth. In the awwal wajib ala al-mukallaf. I don't want to delve into philosophy very much because most of you are beginners. But at one point, we have to highlight some, fa some facts. So this is why I'm making it sort of a basic introduction to Al-Imam Al-Ghazali rather than talking about his books, Maqasid Al-Falasifa or Tahafut Al-Falasifa or other works. But I want to highlight this important thing. What is the first thing that is obligatory upon a seeker of truth? Al-Mukallaf, a responsible person. There are a variety of opinions. It was an nazam Ibrahim an nazam in 3rd century of Hijra who came up with an opinion that was rejected by scholars saying that the first thing obligatory is shak, which Kant many centuries later said and was known for. That is to say, to doubt shak, to doubt everything that is in front of you. But this was rejected by the majority of Muslim theologians because what you have to do in the beginning is to receive the truth and believe in it. Then you search for it. When you reach a high level of knowledge, then you can start the process again to develop your Iman from a level of blind following to a level of being established or being convinced. This is what Imam al-Ghazali did. So we should not misunderstand Imam al-Ghazali. So don't take it as, as a method of reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ignorant people and for beginners. What applies on Imam al-Ghazali doesn't apply on us. You have to reach a level similar to the level of Imam al-Ghazali, then you would reflect upon the philosophies, upon the doctrines, upon the variety of opinions that are within the Islamic sphere. This is something that's also important to notice. That's something that is within the Islamic sphere. Because the truth doesn't go beyond Islam. And Imam al-Ghazali was very sure about this. The truth doesn't go beyond Islam. And when he classifies the people or the intellectual schools of his time, he classifies them in four. Theologians and al batiniya the sects that claim to represent Islam, but they deviated from Islam and they rejected the Sharia. And al falasifa the philosophers who were also Muslims, but approached Islam from a very different approach. And al sufiya the Sufis. So he was talking about searching for the truth within the Islamic sphere, not outside of it, which is different from the Western approach when you go to search for the truth outside every religion, standing outside and looking for the truth. So it is very difficult to, to reach the truth in any religion, even in Christianity now, it's very difficult for any person to believe in Christianity if you rely on the methods provided in the Western academia. Because they make you turn away from it. So this is why Imam al-Ghazali was very firm on that point. In terms of searching for the truth, you have to have a certain level of knowledge which allows you to, to doubt and then to study deeply the subject, the opinion, to move to another area, to another subject, to another opinion. Then you would be able to reach the truth with the light provided to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are righteous, if you are following a path of worship, a path of self-struggle, a path of dhikr to enlighten your heart. The light Allah provides for you will help you reaching your goal. But to start from where you are now as a common believer and say, I want to search for the truth. No, your job is to learn, to sit with the scholars and learn. The path of Ahlul Sunnah is very clear. What the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala left the Sahaba on what the Sahaba left the Tabi'een on within the realm of the four Sunni schools. So the Western understanding of Imam al-Ghazali takes him out of his context to manipulate his method in a non-Islamic climate to make Muslims go out of Islam. So they dictate on us the approach of shak, the approach of doubt, to make us, well, there might be a possibility that Christianity is true. Well, I would say this in the course of a debate. And I'm not forbidden to say this. We or you are either on guidance or misguidance. In the course of a debate, you may say to your opponent that you might be right, I might be wrong. And at the same time, he should admit that you might be wrong and he might be, you might be right and he might be wrong. 
he should admit it because we're searching for the truth. Now, let's go to search for the truth. Then you provide the proof to him that Allah is one, then he should admit it because there's no way to refute a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And most of the preoccupations of atheists are not in challenging the proofs that God exists. No, they challenge the definition of God. If you read books written by atheists, famous professors like Nelson and others, they challenge the definition of God. Define for me God. They keep you busy for hours in attempts to define God. Well, our debate is not about God who cannot be defined by human beings. Our definition is, is there a creator to this world who is pre-eternal and post-eternal, has no beginning and no end, who is not contingent? When we prove that there is a creator who didn't have a beginning and was not created, then we prove his attributes, then we prove the rest of his attributes, and we come to the result, the conclusion, that there must be a God, and then you go to study the messages and the revelation and so on to prove every point one by one. So the atheist cannot challenge any of the arguments, like design arguments, seriously. There are no serious challenges to the arguments, kalam argument, design argument, or other arguments that prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his unity and his other attributes. All of they challenge is the way to define Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the strongest proof they have against the existence of God actually does not relate to any of the proofs that argue about or for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The strongest argument they have against God is the presence of evil. So it's a completely different, in a completely different area. So we have to understand from that point that we cannot start from nowhere as a Muslim brother or a sister, getting that approach, applying it in modern societies by what the Western academia tell us, that you have to study Christianity, you have to study Judaism, you have to study Buddhism, you have to study... Well, there are as many ideologies in the world as many people there are. And you will spend your lifetime studying all these subjects and you won't reach the, the truth. So your goal is, as a Muslim, to look for the truth within the Islamic environment by increasing your knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And leave it to the scholars to refute Christianity. It's not up to you. Leave it to the scholars to refute other doctrines and ideologies. You don't have to go through it yourself, and not every Muslim has to go through the same level. You have been provided guidance by birth, or some of you converted to Islam, Allah guided you to Islam. So don't lose the way. What I'm saying probably people understand, especially converts who reverted to the original primordial religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nature of human beings, understand this very well because they went through a lot of struggle. And by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by opportunity, giving them this opportunity, they were exposed to the Quran. Someone gave them the mushaf as a gift. Someone, they came across a Muslim. They saw a program. They read a book. They came into Islam through that. But if you go as a Muslim, yourself as a Muslim, to sit in a college and listen for one month to lectures on Christianity, you'll turn up to doubt all Islamic facts. Before going into that, you have to establish your knowledge in Islam. So from that point, actually, Muslims have monopoly of the educational system. And it is obligatory on us to have a monopoly of the educational system. That is to say, we cannot teach kids in schools about Christianity. We cannot teach them because they haven't established their, their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their knowledge about Allah, and not all of them will be able to advocate their deen against challenges or fallacies brought by Christianity or others. It's not wrong from that approach to limit your study on one point or one level. I wanted to delve into that and highlight this fact because Imam al-Ghazali is commonly misunderstood in the West from that point and from that approach of doubt. His level allowed him to reflect upon every school of thought and study it very thoroughly. But our level won't allow us to reflect upon the same schools or at the same level.